start record here. Um, good morning. Uh, other people are coming on, but uh, we have a lot to cover. Uh, three um, three chapters, and I'll, let me get straight to the uh, problem sets because uh, they are. Uh, I don't say intense, but they're quite comprehensive, um, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, it must be. Um, <clears throat> these three chapters are all about elasticity, price elasticity of demand, which, you know, is a measure of how much purchases change with price changes as a uh, proportion. Uh, that's how prices are set, depending upon the price elasticity of goods. And we're talking about companies that have uh, multi-products, perhaps face a little competition, face more, or own the entire um, supply of the good, like uh, Cowboy Stadium. Uh, and there are several rules that uh, uh, the chapters go over. Uh, several scenarios, but uh, let me uh, <clears throat> uh, refer you to uh, the PowerPoints that uh, in their summaries, I could go over those, but uh, let me get to the questions to make sure we cover them all. Uh, Cowboy Stadium, what would be the efficient uh, revenue management uh, implied for the pricing of Cowboy Stadium? Parking lot on a typical game day. That's one question, and I want to make sure that everyone answers all three of them. There's three questions there the typical game day, Super Bowl, and smaller events that fill up less than half of the lot. So you have three pricing options there. You know, what are they going to do? Now, remember uh, that uh, they own the parking lot. There's three different types of events, so they're faced with very different pricing uh, uh, decisions there. <clears throat> and parking lots have a fixed capacity, and this is what we're assumed here. They can't open any field or anything like that. So there's only so many cars they can, they can fit in. Uh, <clears throat> we already know that uh, uh, marginal costs to them are zero. They've already built. The parking lot, they've, uh, we should assume that they don't have to worry about parking attendance and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so their marginal cost basically is zero. Um, <clears throat> uh, so um, on a typical day, the margin revenue at capacity is somewhere between two values. Um, with a fixed capacity, um, they're able to get a lot of revenue. So their simple strategy is uh, pricing low enough, this is a regular game, pricing low enough to fill the lot, but high enough that you um, uh, won't turn away any, uh, any co uh, consumers. So what it means is they, they price sort of in the middle not too high because they don't want to chase people away and not too low because there's a fixed capacity there. So it's in between uh, basically two, two marginal costs here. Um, so that's uh, the answer to the first question. The second one is Super Bowl. Okay, intense uh, uh, demand. Uh, a lot of people would arrive early for tailgating um, perhaps some wouldn't even be able to get tickets to the game. So it's sort of common sense here. Um, their strategy would be on these type of, uh, very similar to the game days, is um, they want to price low enough to fill the lot, obviously. It's the Super Bowl. But high enough that very few would be turned away. However, the greater demand uh, implies that the price is likely to be higher than on a regular game day. Again, they want a price in the middle. They don't want to chase anybody away, even though the likelihood of that for a Super Bowl is very remote. But they don't want to ch uh, obviously charge low enough where they're not going to make uh, as much money as possible. So uh, at the end of the day, 
Jerry Jones, the owner of the Cowboy Cowboys, knows that uh, the demand will be heavy. They don't want to charge obviously too low, but they'll be able to charge a higher price than normal. So the basic pricing strategy for them is somewhere in the middle, but for the Super Bowl, it's higher. Now for the smaller event, it's the opposite. Again, they want to charge in the middle, but it would be lower than any other um, any other uh, uh, event. Smaller events, they're not going to have capacity. They're not going to have um, uh, uh, a type of situation where a Super Bowl is uh, uh, or elasticity is going to be rather low. Uh, they'll actually lower the bottom price, uh, but they won't. Um, they won't charge low enough that uh, uh, they won't make money. So it's in between. But the lowest price will be smaller. The highest price will be smaller than the other the other two uh, type of uh, circumstances. So again, the basic strategy is in the middle, not too high, not too low. But for the regular game, is uh, here's an instance of right in the right in the middle. They do not want to um, charge too high to charge uh, to uh, uh, turn people away. The Super Bowl is again in the middle, but the the lower part is higher. The higher the higher end is higher. Smaller event in the middle, but the lower end is lower, and the higher end is lower. So they're adjusting for uh, three uh, circumstances there. So questions about that question? You got to answer three, all three of them. And again, the uh, to sum it up again, the best way to do that is to start out by saying their pricing strategy is between a, a low price and a high price, somewhere in between. Um, and the changes. The boundaries change with circumstances. Uh, the second circumstance is the lowest will be higher than the first uh, circumstance and the higher will be higher. And the third is it's lower than the first circumstance. So using the, the regular game as sort of the in-between. Okay. All right, any, any questions about that? Just use all words uh, with that one. Um, chapter 12, like I say, is all about uh, really more complex uh, pricing based upon whether demand is known, price elasticity is known, and so on and so forth. <laughs> but um, the way to analyze situations about pricing how pricing occurs uh, is from the standpoint of how much ownership does the company have over the product, how much competition, and to be able to measure price elasticity of demand. Uh, if people want it, they can charge uh, higher. If they have less substitutes out there, the company can charge higher. And you already know the, uh, the uh, equation for what's called the markup price. Okay, price discrimination, done all the time. Uh, don't let the word discrimination uh, throw you off. Um, uh, <clears throat> but it happens all the time. Uh, I am, uh, I reached uh, senior citizen pricing a long time ago, some long time ago, and I certainly use it. Uh, whenever I go to the movies, I'm a big movie fan and uh, always ask for it. That's price discrimination and um, may upset some people, but there's a reason for that. Um, lots of studies, a lot of marketing studies have proven that perhaps people my age, <laughs> I don't know why, don't go to the movies very often. So lower prices encourage uh, seniors to to go to the movies. Um, I guess that's that's probably true now with the advent of Netflix and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a misnomer to think that uh, us senior citizens don't know how to use Netflix, but that's 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 certainly not <laughs> certainly not the case, at least with me. Um, 
So the price elasticity demand for movies for seniors is um, uh, rather uh, high is, well, there's a lot of substitutes we may not go. So uh, the ability for a company to discriminate or be able to tell uh, what the price elasticity of demand between their customers uh, to discriminate between different groups of customers for the same uh, for the same uh, good itself. That's what price elasticity is. All depends on the company's ability to measure demand uh, for the same product uh, amongst different groups of customers. And I want to point out the Robinson uh, Padman Act is uh, a federal uh, mandate that businesses cannot discriminate or price discriminate huge discounts to other businesses like a wholesaler. But there's ways to get around that, uh, obviously, that we'll talk about in the, in the problem. Um, so let's get to the problem. Selling salsa. <laughs> Your family business produces a secret recipe salsa. Again, secret recipe, it's unusual. It's how to read these questions. Distribute, distribute it through both small specialty stores and big chain supermarkets. The chains have been demanding, demanding sizable discounts, but you do not want to drop your prices uh, to the specialty stores. Here you're running into the uh, um, application of the Robinson Padman Act, so obviously the act has to be in your answer. Can you legally accommodate the chains without losing profits from the specialty stores? Okay, here's the dilemma. You, do want, you don't want lower prices uh, to everyone, okay? We know that the Walmarts and stuff get big, big discounts. So how do they get around the Pacman, uh, the Robinson Pacman Act? So the answer is you certainly want to continue uh, offering discounts to big supermarkets, um, which is uh, the pa uh, Robinson Pacman Act says you can't do that, but there are several uh, loopholes, you might say, in it, and this is what you should say, is you alter some, here's one answer, you alter the some aspect of the product so that the cost differences are different. Remember that pricing is all predicated upon marginal cost. If you can lower the cost to the big uh, discount chain, lower the marginal cost, you can charge different prices. And for example, uh, it would be the larger customers likely purchase more units per week, um, Therefore, you can off, offer a volume discount. That's what happens is if you order bigger, bigger uh, volume, that's what the Walmarts do. As a uh, supplier, you can lower marginal cost by doing that. So there's the answer to the question is you can offer different prices based upon your ability to lower marginal cost. You have different marginal cost. One higher to the specialty store, you charge them more. If you can lower marginal cost to the big retailer, you can lower the price. So that's that's the answer. Basically, uh, another example of lowering the marginal cost for the big big uh, purchaser is your shipping and handling cost certainly are, are cheaper. You just bundle things and it's usually the same thing. So again, the answer is different marginal costs, different prices. So the act uh, is, is a good law in that you just can't arbitrarily keep your same cost and charge different things. It forces the company the, uh, wholesaler to do something to lower their cost. So it's a win-win situation. Win for the company, win for the two different buyers. Okay. So uh, that's very typical of this chapter is price discrimination 
uh, you might ask, how does a movie theater know? Well, they just take counts of senior citizens. It's a tried and true uh, manner. Uh, plus, they know that uh, uh, AARP gives large discounts and so on and so forth. So they want a block of people uh, to come. Matinee prices, so on and so forth. Um, usually a little cheaper um, to um, to go to a matinee. Not as many people go. The price elasticity is rather high, so they can lower the price. You might say, "Well, how's marginal cost different?" Well, that's just price discrimination. Marginal cost is 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 the same. There, perhaps, although it could be lower, they don't hire as many people to the concession stand and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a discount theater in uh, Louisville called Village 8. Um, I don't think the Kentucky and Lexington is that way anymore. Maybe it is, but they charge very little. They um, uh, have sort of long running uh, movies, so their marginal cost is lower and they're in a very cheaper had cheaper overhead, so again, their marginal cost is different. There's always a reason why you don't have to pay as much because the business's marginal cost is lower than their competitor. Okay, um, so questions about that answer? Again, answering that with words. Oh, um, I have a question. Yes. Um, um, I just, for 14.3, well, problem set 11. Uh -huh. I, I had just um, put the two points it said um, in the chapter mm -hmm. claiming the price discount was cost justified or that the price discount was given to meet competition. Uh -huh. um, would that work for the answer or from the answer you gave, would it just be the first one claiming the price discount was cost justified with your explanation? Well, uh, that is a general way to say that. Uh, I'd like you to, to say something like, you know, what it really is, their cost is lower. They're, it's the, it's, they're forced to lower their cost. And it's uh, the reason I want you to say that again is you're understanding that pricing is based upon cost. So to offer a lower price, obviously their marginal cost or overall cost are lower giving them the ability to do that. Okay. Yeah, the, the textbook gets to it, but I want you to, you know, be a little bit more specific there. That's a, uh, uh, the marginal cost uh, affecting price is a, um, a standard theory in economics. In other words, that's how we justify, uh, that's how we explain price in the real world. Um, okay, good question. Any other questions about that? And again, I really stress, you know, this question um, has one answer and one question, but uh, the previous uh, question, there's three questions. And that's what I always look for. Do you answer the entire question? There's three sub questions there. So, um, you know, that's, that's very important. Um, okay, very good. Now, um, chapter 14, indirect price discrimination. Uh, here's a difference is I love this unit uh, because we're dealing with real things and things that you might, uh, pricing in markets that we, you might wonder about is how does, how can they do that? Indirect price discrimination, we do see it all the time. We economists explain that by saying the seller cannot identify um, differences in demand for its customers for a product. They can't identify them or really don't want to. Now, oh, let me say that um, for a company to be able to price discriminate, uh, they can uh, prevent arbitrage, we know that is scalping, okay? Um, 
it's easy for a cowboy stadium to not uh, uh, or to prevent scalping. You don't normally scalp parking tickets, uh, although that's uh, can be done. But uh, arbitrage, that's what it means, is a secondary market, a secondary market. Um, um, the online ticketing, which I use all the time, you know, the resale of tickets has uh, um, done uh, concerts, ball games, uh, a huge favor is um, that's basically eliminating scalping. Um, they get uh, their surcharges, the, the, the team or whatnot, the stadium arena gets a cut of that. But chapter 14 is about a different situation where there's a secondary market going on. So how does a company um, offer different prices? Again, it comes back to price elasticity of demand. So your answer about the microwave oven comes back to that price elasticity of demand. Okay, so um, how they get around it, offer volume discounts, two-part pricing, again, indirect, indirect. That uh, phrase comes from the inability of a seller to um, identify the difference between low and high value customers. Microwave oven, great example here. Now here, this question has a bunch of sub questions and you've got numbers there. So you've got to deal with the uh, numbers, okay? Uh, manufacturer of microwaves have discovered that male shoppers have little value for microwaves. That's not true. Uh, I do. Uh, and uh, attribute almost no extra value to auto defrost feature. Okay. That's female shoppers generally value uh, microwave ovens more than men and have a higher value for the defrost feature. Now, what this part of the question is defining is it's all about price elasticity of demand. High value consumers means they have a lower price elasticity. A low uh, value means they have a higher price elasticity. They don't really care, okay? They don't really care. High value, low uh, price elasticity. So they want to. They want that feature, so they would want to pay more for that uh, for the microwave. Okay, there's a little additional cost to incorporating a micro, a auto defrost. Additional cost, marginal cost again. Okay, it doesn't cost uh, GE much more to install a uh, auto defrost. Again, pricing is predicated upon cost, the cost of producing an additional microwave. That's marginal cost. So that's red flags, you gotta have that in your answer. Um, so, um, a little additional cost, little marginal cost. Since men and women cannot be charged different prices for the same product, they don't wanna do that. Why? Well, um, they don't want to seem like, um, you know, when you go to the uh, Sears or wherever you buy microwaves, uh, they don't want to have the same microwave next to each other and say, if you're a man, you, well, you can buy this one and so on. They don't want to do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the manufacturer has to, uh, determined that men value a simple microwave oven at $70 and one with auto uh, defrost at 80, while women value a simple microwave at 80, and one with defrost is $150, okay? So there you have what the two genders are willing to pay for the product with the, basically the same marginal cost, okay? So obviously um, the retailer um, wants to charge different prices. They want to price discriminate. So, the sub-question, if there was an equal number of men and women, what pricing strategy would yield the greatest revenue? Okay, so 
uh, and what what if women comprise the bulk of the microwave shoppers? Okay. The first sub question, the first question is you have an equal number of men and women, so you've got to answer that. Now, okay, and what if women comprise the bulk of the microwave shoppers, which is probably the truth. Now, the answer has three probabilities. Click that. Three possibilities. So, you got to have three answers. Three answers. No way to get around it. Okay. First, they can market a single microwave with auto defrost to both men and women at 80 bucks. Okay. At $80. They can do that. Okay. Low end pricing. Low end pricing. Okay. Um, Again, auto defrost. Men are willing to pay $80. Women are uh, ready to pay $80. Okay, that's the low end pricing. High for men, low for women. They could do that. Uh, second, they can market a single microwave with auto defrost only to women at $150. Okay. Third, they can uh, uh, put out a version by selling a single microwave targeted to men for 70 and a auto defrost version targeted to women for 140. Um, now, here's the math. How they come up with 140, okay? 70 is what the men want to charge or want to buy the simple microwave for. They're offering two different types of products now, remember that. One with auto defrost and one without. Two different products. So how do they arrive at the price for the women? Okay, 70 plus 150 minus 80. Now, let me repeat that. 70 plus 150 minus 80. That's how they arrive at 140. That should be 140, uh, yes. Okay, want me to say that again? If you just come up with 140, you got it, okay? But uh, you need to know where it comes from, how they do that. 70, the low end, what the guys would pay for the simple thing. Uh, what the women will pay for the auto defrost, minus 80. Minus 80, 80 is what the women will pay for the simple one. Okay, that should make some sense. Okay. So the existence of the uh, simple one uh, constrains our pricing on the auto. One. It's a constraint, okay. We're offering two different products. And this is a case where the men and women have this, uh, buy microwaves at the, at the same amount. Want me to repeat that, anybody? Yes. Yes, okay. please. Okay. Uh, all that, both those three possibilities are answering the first part of that question. Okay. And this is a question easy to miss. Okay. In that, I'll be looking for three things here. First, um, the company makes one type of microwave with um, uh, auto defrost, the more complicated one, to both men and women at $80. That's uh, a straightforward answer. Is that is the price that both men and women are willing to pay, okay? That's the lower price, lower price. They have to charge that because they can't price discriminate, okay? Second, they make two types of microwaves. Uh, let's see. Oh, well, that's, that's not right. Sorry about that. The second option is they market a simple microwave or single microwave with auto defrost only to women at $150. They don't really try to sell anything to men. I misstated that. Let me say that again. The second option Single microwave, the, the more complicated, only to women at $150, okay? They just forget men, which is probably the, the real 
the real thing. I'm running out of time here. Third is they make two types. Two types. The simple one for men at 70 and the auto, auto defrost version to women for 140, not 150. Not 150, okay. 140. The existence of the, the, uh, the two products, one simple, one auto defrost, constrains the auto defrost, okay. Now, the second part of the uh, question is women buy more of the product, okay. If women value the auto defrost feature at $70, and therefore, a price cannot exceed a simple one by more than 70. Um, if there's an equal number of men and women, say one of each, revenue from each of the three strategy is 80 times two, 160, okay? And it's asking about the revenue there, $160. So, um, is asking which is one the best is where where is the revenue from the three strategies? Um, so the first option is 160. The second option is 150. Uh, the third option um, is 210. 160. The first option 150. Uh, the second option. 210, so therefore the best option is offering two different versions. Two different versions. And on the other hand, if all the shoppers are women, the best strategy would be only to sell microwaves with auto defrost at 150. So a very comprehensive question and very comprehensive answer. Three possibilities for the first section of the uh, answer. The second is you got to come up with a revenue. 160 for the first option, 150 for the second, 210 for the third. So the best option is to make two varieties. The last part of the answer is if only women, if women were the only shoppers, they can charge 150. Anybody want me to repeat that? Sure. Yes, please. Okay, I'm looking for a comprehensive answer. The first answer is three possibilities. The first is they offer a single uh, microwave that has auto defrost to both men and women at $80. That's the price that both would pay for it at the very low end. Second, they make two versions. Oh, excuse me. Ah, I keep getting there. Second, they market a single microwave with auto defrost only to women at 150. Okay, that ends up being the best option. Third, they make two versions: one charging 70, and the other they 140. So, first possibility is they make a single microwave with auto defrost and charge 80 bucks. Second, they make a um, uh, auto defrost, sell it only to women. Third, they make two versions and uh, target women, sell it for men for 70 and sell to women for 140. So based upon the revenue projections is, uh, <clears throat> uh, there's three different revenue streams, 160, 150, and 210. So offering the two versions is the best. On the other hand, if all the women are, all the shoppers are women, the price is 150. Okay, so I'm looking for three parts there, three parts. And probably, not that I set it up this way, I want everybody in the class to, to get online, to view these in, in person, but um, um, let me uh, 